All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with our afternoon portion. So for those of you who might have come in for the afternoon portion, I'm Dr. Carrie Castile. I'm the new state director for USDA Rural Development. And I will tell you, it's an honor and privilege to be able to have a round table that talks about the challenges that we have with the opioid as well as our substance use disorders, the epidemic that we have that's nationwide. Um, it's, I think we have a fantastic panel. I do want to point out that the empty seats in the room, that was our hackers. So what a great crowd that we had and a great interest that we had from both high school and college students that see this as a priority. Took their time out. They're going to be working, what, Ramesh, 24 hours? 24 hours nonstop. They can stop for crawfish. <laughs> they stop for crawfish. No beer. No, well, they're high school students. Pizza at midnight. So coffee? Do they get coffee? There you go. All right. So anyway, so uh, it was really great to see our, our hackers in the room, and what a great opportunity to combine technology and innovation with a, a real-world problem, and looking at, again, trying to find solutions. So I do want to bring up someone, um, and she is um, our, our special advisor to the Secretary on Opioids. Her name is Ms. Betty Ann Bryce. She flew down from Utah, I believe, right? Were you in Utah? So we're one of a handful of states um, that has had the opioid roundtables. So I think so far we're the third one. We're the third one. We're the best one, I will tell you that. Because I think we have the best capabilities we have the, in terms of, of panelists and be, in terms of opportunities. I think it's endless. So Betty Ann, would you mind saying a few words? And Pradesh. Good afternoon. And, um, Love the opportunity to talk about this issue, and thank you for welcoming you, um, the Department of Agriculture into this space. We are looking at it seriously because um, around the end, close to the end of last year, I think the CDC approached us in DC and pointed out that the deaths um, as a result of um, overdose related to opioids was increasing in rural areas at a dramatic pace, and in some cases surpassing urban. And since we are the agency that has rural in the title, we were kind of, um, we were approached about what more we can do and what more should we be doing. The beauty of rural development and the Department of Agriculture is we are already in rural communities. We're already in this space. It's really just a matter of becoming more familiar with what our agency can do. We are an agency with a $200 billion portfolio we are an agency that is responsible for what is happening in rural communities. We can help in many ways, whether it's a treatment facility, whether it's a recovery house, whether it is equipment, whether it's an ambulance, whether it's a police car. Our division, our department is well placed in rural communities. They are already out there doing this work. They've been doing this work for years. The, probably the disconnect is this is a newer community for rural development, Department of Agriculture. Probably many of you have never approached the Department of Agriculture, but we are encouraging you, and that's with, Car with Carrie and with um, Mr. Lee Jones, to get in touch and to really find out how we can help you in this space. We are very concerned about this issue because um, the Secretary has pointed out that our mission is to help rural communities thrive, prosper, and it's difficult to do when people are dying. We have embarked on a s series of roundtables because we want to understand what more we can do beyond what is already being done. And as Carrie pointed out, we started with a roundtable in Pennsylvania. We had one in Utah on two days ago. I'm losing time because I'm here today. And we are going to have one in Oklahoma focusing on tribal issues. We're going to have one in Kentucky focusing on why certain counties are so vulnerable to hepatitis C, to HIV. We're also, we're picking up all the issues as we go along. We're bringing in new communities. We've been approached by the business sector, employers who have been telling us they're being left out of the conversation and they're seeing it in their workforce. They don't recognize it. The farmer, farming community has approached us as well. The mining community has approached us as well. So we just want to let you know that there are 
lots of lots of groups of folks where, that are seeing this issue that are coming to the table and wanting to know what they can do to help. So we see that we can bring a lot more to the table, uh, potentially a lot more resources can be, we can collaborate with our federal partners and we are working to do that. And so my message for you today is to work with our rural um, constituency, work with our representatives here, they can give you more information. And finally, we did um, recently announce the availability of funding for DLT services and telemedicine, which is a big part of our portfolio. And um, we are having a webinar that I will allow Carrie and um, Lee to talk more about. But obviously to tackle and to access our resources, we are doing a public webinar next week on Monday for stakeholders to call in and to learn more about how they can apply for the funds. But we did do a uh, reserve some funding for uh, community facilities and for DLT and that is something that I wanted to bring to your attention today because it's something you can access pretty quickly. Thank you. Betty Ann did mention the availability of funds that we have. We do have some recipients in the room from our distance learning and telemedicine grants. We actually have C.N. Robinson, Lafayette General Foundation. He was actually awarded, well, the foundation was awarded um, funding from last year's cycle, and it's my understanding that he's going to be applying this year. And the project that they've undertaken it, with telemedicine is, is to improve absenteeism in our rural communities. And it's a tremendous opportunity to take and build on what they've done, use that as a model, and be able to apply that statewide. So I commend Lafayette General Foundation for the work that they've done. Thank you, Cian. And, and again, the opportunities here are endless. Um, I'm going to be working with the state as well as Senator Cassidy to make sure that the information gets out to the right people. Um, there's, I, I, my fear is, is that people don't understand or don't know about our programs through USDA Rural Development. So I will tell you, I have three staff members here. I have, to miss, I have Mr. Lee Jones, Lee Wade. He's my assistant state director, as well as I call him my deputy. Um, I also have Ms. Heather Ryan Bowie. She's one of our program directors, as well as Ms. Karen Lawson, who's my PIO. So we have a tremendous staff. We have tremendous opportunities. And I will tell you, we have resources. So we're in a fortunate position. And the only way that we can do this is through partnerships. So thanks again. Now it is my honor and privilege to introduce our moderator. Uh, he's a dear friend. He saw me grow up. Uh, I will tell you, and Senator Fred Mills, uh, he really needs no introduction. But uh, one thing to note is, is he's not only a pharmacist, um, he really does a great commercial, by the way. You need to Google these. <laughs> Phenomenal. The best commercials. He's a pharmacist, but he's also our chairman of our Senate Health and Welfare Committee. And I can't tell you how proud we are of his leadership and how fortunate we are to be able to have him at the helm at the state legislature. So thanks again. Good afternoon, everybody. Just a, a side note, I hate to brag on myself, but Carrie did forget something. Dr. Castile did forget something. We talked about crawfish. In 1981, my goal was to be the world champion crawfish eater. So I trained and trained and trained, and I entered the contest, and I ate 22 pounds of bald crawfish in an hour. And I thought that would get me a championship. Well, a man ate 40 pounds of crawfish in 30 minutes. It must have been a bad event, because I won three cases of Schlitz, and he won one case of Schlitz. For, I came out third. So I uh, just wanted to mention that to you. I wanted to put that on my resume. Dr. Castillo, you did forget that, but it's OK. It's OK. Yo, we have a, a, a star line cast of people that, that are going to give us a lot of great information. That's what we want to do. We want to integrate that information and learn a lot more. And I'd like to ask Senator Cassidy to address the Drew group, U.S. Senator Cassidy. I had a pleasure of serving with him when I was in the State House and he was a state senator. And I want to thank you on behalf of everybody here for the fight that you make and you do every day for health care and for the service that you've done, not only as a legislator, but as a physician. So. Uh, Senator, would you uh, address our group and tell us your opening thoughts, and then we're going to begin some discussions. I will be brief. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if it's, can, you got a mic working? Um, hey, Fred, thank you. Thank you all. Um, at this point, I'm here to listen. I may pose some questions to you, questions that I can't quite figure out. How are we going to allocate the amount of money we put towards prevention? Is that prevention law enforcement? Is it 
Um, uh, what do we do with them? I was once told if you put a, a user into jail, it's a wonderful opportunity to network as to where they're going to buy their next set of drugs. Okay? But on the other hand, you got to do something. Because people with experience tell me that if there are no consequences, there will be no change in behavior. Now, I don't quite know how to balance that. But there's a lot of folks in this room who have either have been frontline either because you've had a family member, a personal addiction, you've been in law enforcement, treatment, or whatever. And so, Fred, I just look forward to the conversation, and I thank you all so much for being here and so much for caring about the issue. Thank you for being here, all of you, and we'll have a chance to visit with each and every one of you soon. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gershonik, did I say it right? Yeah, it's, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Senator Mills. I'm very uh, thankful for uh, the folks here at ULL, the USDA. Uh, very humble to be uh, giving this brief presentation, which I find very challenging to give a 10 minute presentation on the opioid epidemic and the scope of it. Uh, but very humble to be with Secretary Gee, Senator Cassidy, Dr. Collada, and Karen Stubbs up here. Uh, what I'd like to sort of first talk about is, and what I've been asked to talk about, is the opioid crisis in both America and Louisiana. And to try to focus primarily on the rural aspect of it. Um, it's challenging to get all this in 10 minutes, first off. Secondly, uh, three things I sort of want people to take away from this is one, how extensive this opioid epidemic goes, both from the urban standpoint and the rural standpoint, all the systems and communities it hits. Two, the challenges around data on the opioid epidemic. And three, understanding where we are in Louisiana, where we're going, and what's along the way. Where I see challenges, I see opportunities. So first, I'd like to first discuss the literature out there. National numbers on opioids. So, we know from 2016, roughly two-thirds of all drug overdose deaths were presumed to have an opioid on board and due to an opioid. That's greater than 42,000 people who died of an opioid overdose. That's 116 Americans every day and one every 15 minutes. By the time we finish this panel, that's another eight individuals, and that's five times higher, or up to five times higher, than in 1999. Ranges are from three to five times. We know that hospitalizations, the ED utilization has gone up. It's increased 99.4% to be exact from 2005 to 2014, and 30% over the last year. Inpatient stays have increased. Pediatric hospitalizations have doubled. Of those pediatric hospitalizations, kids mainly go to the ICU. And interesting enough, it's in the age range of primarily 12 to 17, so those teenagers that first access it, and those little kids from one to five years old who end up going into the, the cabinet, taking the medications, and seeing these, uh, the repercussions of that. Additionally, neonatal abstinence syndrome, or neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, has increased nationally 400% from 2000 to 2012, and that's one infant affected every 25 minutes. Furthermore, opioid prescriptions have nearly quadrupled from 1999 to 2010, while pain has not changed in the reporting. The promising here is at least over the last five years, prescription rates uh, nationwide have gone down. Primarily for this conversation, I just want to stick to mainly prescriptions and overdose deaths, around the data we're doing in the state and with the Department of Health. Now when you look at the drugs involved in U.S. overdose deaths from 2000 to 2016, I put all the, all the drugs on here because as you see, the leading ones are synthetic opioids and other opioids over the last five years. However, not to be lost are cocaine and methamphetamines that still have an impact in different parts of the country. When we met for Region 6 with Health and Human Services, we talked how in different states we had different passages of drugs that are causing these overdose deaths. And so often we have to think of this as an addiction issue with multiple drugs on board because often an individual who dies of an overdose doesn't just have one drug on board, but multiple drugs on board. When you look specifically at opioids, the breakdown are as follow. These are medications that come not just from prescriptions, but on the streets and via the black market, via the web. And as you can see, the primary one that's increased are these synthetic opioids, along with this dramatic increase in heroin, which has also been seen from the data from the DEA and others in the field. Now the issue around drug and opioid overdose deaths is that it's difficult to designate a death due to an opioid overdose, and it's complicated. There's no standardized manner. It's up often to the coroner and to the medical examiner. Uh, toxicology capabilities are different, so when you look at things from rural to more urban, there's locations which don't have the full capacity to evaluate whether someone dies of fentanyl or, their, or heroin metabolites. And so that's one component when you compare rural, both rural to sort of urban, different capacities of toxicology has an impact on that, along with different providers that are the coroners who are just stating if they have advanced degrees in, in medicine or if they're just a medical examiner trying to evaluate. 
Often again, as I discussed, single opioids versus multiple drugs. The reporting and the coding of death certificates are also something that's difficult. Often the data we have are just based on the codes and not just on the full information that's out there. And this is something that causes trouble when we look at the data as a whole. As I mentioned, the deaths are due both to legal and illegal, and the most commonly reported ones are synthetic opioids, heroin, and fentanyl. If you look at the CDC website, it tells you how opioid deaths are commonly underreported. Sometimes say only one in five death certificates accurately report an opioid death. So we must understand this to know that the problem is bigger than what we believe it is. Here we have from the CDC site, when you first look at opioid overdose deaths from their site, they show, as you can see here, all drug overdose deaths because they know it's difficult to designate. Two thirds are presumed to have the opioid, and as we see here, Louisiana is in the leaders nationwide when you age adjust for our population. It's one of the top 22, and not only that, but it's the one of the 13 that have shown a statistically significant increase of all drug overdose deaths in the last two years. Furthermore, we know from a demographic standpoint, the data shows that there's been an increase in all ages, uh, but primarily, most statistically significant rate has been in the 45 to 54 year old range. Men are most likely to die from a drug overdose compared to women. However, in recent years, that gap is closing. Furthermore, demographically, uh, non-Hispanic whites and American Indian or Alaskan Natives have the highest rate, but in the last five years, we've seen the gap close. Initially, that was the increase, and over the last five years, we've seen a, a, similar, gap, a similar increase in, very, in all demographics. Now, in rural America in October, there was a report that came out, uh, survey-based, uh, that sort of demonstrated what was the increase in rural America. And yeah, it's true. Deaths are occurring more in rural America nowadays when you base on the population rates than in urban America. However, as a whole, most of the deaths are occurring in urban America because that's where the demographics are. Most of these deaths occur at home, so if someone is in rural America and someone's dying at home, where's EMS? Where are the hospitals? Where's the naloxone on hand? From what I heard earlier today, there was discussions of what resources folks have in rural America, and so when you have an overdose deaths, it's harder to get out there, it's harder to treat, it's harder to reverse. Now, the one thing that we have here in Louisiana and recently the last year, there's been reports done on the accuracy of opioid deaths in the state of Louisiana, and sadly enough, we're not that accurate. Uh, we have a high rate, and we're pretty accurate with the overall overdose rates of all drugs, but when it comes to opioids, we're sort of not, that, not doing well. Uh, and when you correct it, we can go all the way, as you can see on the right-hand side here, from 40th to 21st when you correct the numbers of opioid deaths in this state. So really knowing those numbers help dictate what drugs people are dying of on the streets. Furthermore, when you look at the CDC, you then have to say, well, where is Louisiana when it comes to this map is around synthetic opioid death rates? Well, if you look at the map, Louisiana is in gray. Why is that? Well, it's because we don't have the valid numbers to sort of say if we are increasing or not. Similarly, same thing with heroin. So we need to get these numbers accurate and right in order to know where the issue is around the state and where we direct our resources. The President's Commission, HHS, CDC, have all said key to all of this is having better data and strengthening that data and standardizing in a way so that we can know where the deaths are occurring across the state and from state to state because often some of these things happen across state lines. Furthermore, the CDC has uh, provided enhanced state opioid overdose surveillance grants of which we were, uh, a, we were a winner of the last couple of years uh, to provide more timely and comprehensive data so we can know where things are and where these overdose deaths are occurring in the United States. So what we've done at the Louisiana Department of Health is through these federal grants on data, collected up to about $2.3 million through 2020 uh, for what we call our Louisiana Opioid Surveillance Initiative or what I like calling a PAC, sort of a partnership for accurate, comprehensive, and timeliness on opioid data so that we can identify data sources validate it and align the sources together so we can understand where this epidemic is across our state. The goals for this is to sort of have rapid surveillance data on overdose deaths, create and maintain an online surveillance system, do some internal evaluations, and use the data to measure outcomes of programs. Now, on the bottom here are people we've already reached out to in our state, from law enforcement to EMS to the hospital association to our own inpatient data and the Office of Public Health, vital statistics where the deaths and where births are, corner offices so we can work in collaboration, the Board of Pharmacy and the prescription data, so forth and so on with our Office of Behavioral Health, Medicaid and Poison Control. All these are different data and different people that have to work together to know where things are going on. So here's a quick example of the data for Louisiana. In our vital records, we had 320 deaths due to opioids uh, in 2016. Now 305 of those deaths were folks from Louisiana. But what we don't know is what these other 512 overdose deaths are, unspecified multi-drug. 
And these, these rates have tripled in the last six years and doubled in the last five years. And we want to know what the true number is. So what we've done most currently is we've talk, talked to all the corner offices and we're collaborating between them, our vital records, and our Bureau of Health Informatics to sort of know what these true numbers are. We're building partnerships to enhance these systems to improve both the accuracy, the comprehensiveness, and the timeliness of this data. And our funds are going to help support some of these corners so they can do the extensive evaluation of the drugs that are killing folks on the streets. We're also now breaking down to understand which one of the opioids are causing these deaths so that we can understand and be along the standards of what things are going on nationally. We're also visualizing this data so we know what's going on across the state so we can know where those deaths are occurring and be able to target where our interventions would be. Again, these numbers are preliminary based on data that has not been validated or accurate yet. We've already seen increases of three to four times when we talk to coroners to ensure data is accurate. And furthermore, just to sort of identify what the data source is and knowing what the number, the true number is, this is these are prescription data information from the CDC. This comes from IMS quintiles that takes 88% of retail pharmacy data to sort of delineate what the prescription rates are. And as you can see here, it has 98.1 as a prescription rate in Louisiana and 66.5 for the nation. I'll explain this in a second. What we've done here in partnering through our grants is we've worked with the, the Board of Pharmacy and the Prescription Monitoring Program and have all 99% to almost 100% of that data so that we know what the true uh, value is for the opioid uh, pharmacy and opioid prescriptions that are out in the field. And we've seen this decrease by collaborating with them and using the data so that we can sort of educate the public and know where things are. Currently we're at 106 for 100 citizens. Furthermore, we're then putting this in the map and sort of targeting locations. So we know West Feliciana actually has uh, the lowest per population at 71 prescriptions uh, per 100 citizens. Orleans has done well as well. Madison, so forth and so on. And we're correlating that also to the deaths. Then there's other parishes that are pretty high. Once we know where these locations are, we can then target the resources and put the interventions in place to make a difference. So when I was asked to sort of evaluate rural versus urban, so I, I reached into this data, so this is actually some new data here, and looked into the population of both the highest prescribing parishes and the lowest prescribing parishes. And you can see there's a mix of both high population and low population. Furthermore, when we uh, look at the most rural parishes in Louisiana and the most metropolitan parishes in Louisiana, what it shows is the difference in population, as you can see here. What's interesting, the prescription rate, when you average the most uh, rural parishes in Louisiana is 130, whereas the most urban are 100, so a difference of 30. Additionally, this is a difference between what the CDC reports, which is 88% of the pharmacies, and what we're currently reporting with our more accurate and comprehensive information, and knowing that the difference, when you look at one parish to another, is 91.6% versus the bigger cities and more urban cities in Louisiana, which is only 2.5%. We even had to call the CDC to tell them they don't have a number for Cameron Parish, but the number that we have is 95.4. So in turn, we're in the process of uh, finalizing our first version of our surveillance uh, system for the state where we're gonna be looking at the information per, uh, on deaths, prescriptions, hospitalizations, ED utilization, EMS, and have it be able to be broken down by parish. This is the first draft of it, it's in development. And together, if we work together, both in partnerships with the data and with the interventions, we can really make a difference with what's going on in our state. With that, thank you. Well, with, with this much data, it gives us a backdrop for our, our discussions that will be going on next. I'd like to invite Ms. Jennifer Holmes, a mental health professional and person in long-term recovery, to now address the group. I was hoping that my uh, fight or flight response would be uh, spent by now and my heart wouldn't still be racing, and, uh, but it's not. So I'm gonna do the best I can uh, considering the circumstances. I come to you today as Jennifer Holmes. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I have a private practice in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I work with people um, with all sorts of disorders, um, including substance use disorders and opioid use disorders. And more importantly, I come to you as a person in long-term recovery. Um, and what that means is that I have not had uh, alcohol or any other mood-altering substance uh, since January 26, 2011. And uh, for that, I am truly grateful. 
Um, I'm also here, I want to sort of dispel some myths that some of you may have about substance use disorders and um, reinforce some issues that I think are really important to focus on if we're really going to address this issue and make a difference. Um, I'm also going to talk about things that will really work, um, in my opinion. But before I start, um, I want everyone just to take a second and take a deep breath and sit up straight and look around the room. On average, one in 10 people suffers from a substance use disorder. Because of the population that we have in this room today, we have a lot of people that are very interested in this subject. I'm gonna say it's higher than that in here. And I'm also gonna say even higher, maybe 100% of people in here know someone who has suffered, um, know someone who is suffering. So um, what I'd like you to do today is listen for one or two things that really jump out at you. And if you can take those things and apply them in the next 24 hours, you're gonna make a difference in this world. This is a chronic, primary, and left untreated terminal disease. This is a fatal disease. But the message I wanna get across to you today is that recovery is possible. And that with the right treatment, this disease can be put into permanent remission. Um, that's a big message. And I think it's one that gets lost uh, sometimes. We focus so much on the disorder and the problem, um, the opioids, the drugs, the alcohol. Um, and what we, I think, sometimes lose focus on is recovery. Recovery is possible. There are 24 million people in America who are in sustained long-term recovery. And with the right kind of treatment, which is not gonna be just one or two things on, on this uh, panel today. It's gonna be a combination. It's gonna need to be tailored to each person. Um, but with that kind of approach, we can put 20 million more into recovery. Um, so I wanna tell you a little bit about my story and maybe if we get close to when I have five minutes left, if someone could give me a, a heads up. I might be totally done by then or I might have a lot more going on, okay. Countdown, excellent, y'all are way ahead of me. Okay, so um, my story doesn't have to do with opioids specifically. Um, I just throw that out to you because I think it's important to make that point for a few different reasons. Um, one is that very few people, the minuscule number of people, begin on the substance use disorder spectrum with opioids or with heroin, very few. The first substance that most people start with is alcohol. And if alcohol is the thing that works for your brain, you may never need anything else ever again. If you are born with addiction, or if you have the epigenetics, that means the, the, the things that are external that may turn those genes on, um, one of those substances is gonna work for you. Um, today we're here to talk about opioids. It's the hot topic. People die from it very quickly. It's important. Um, but it's important for me to tell you that, that alcohol was, um, was the start for me and um, was the thing that really worked for me. Um, I also want to um, get across that um, substance use disorders, to a certain extent, are substance use disorders. And the feelings behind what's underneath that um, are really similar. You know, if you go and you listen to a lot of people's story, a lot of them sound very similar. Um, and they start out like mine started out, um, which is that the alcohol, or the substance, I'm gonna say, um, it didn't start out as a problem. It started out as a solution. So I had my first drink when I was probably 14, 15, you know, New Orleans, Louisiana, whatever, that's, that's what we did. Um, and I think most people, when they have that first drink, you know, they feel silly or, um, you know, get drunk or just have a good time. Um, what happened to me and what happens to um, a lot of people who are born with this uh, disease is that I had a feeling of, I could breathe. I had this thought of, I didn't know this existed. I didn't know that I could feel connected to people. Um, the word that crossed my mind, and keep in mind I'm 14, 15 years old, is I felt normal. 
So, so the substance for me made me feel normal. And the relief that came from that, imagine that you have cancer and you find out this thing works and it treats your cancer. The relief that comes from that. Now, it didn't stay my solution. At some point, it turned into a problem. Um, and the same thing happens with all substances. Um, so uh, in the beginning, and for a very long time, um, I didn't really have many consequences. Um, the consequences that I had were internal. You know, I never got a DWI. I never ended up in jail. Um, you know, I dealt with things like waking up and saying, you know, where's my purse? Where, where did this bruise come from? Um, you know, what did I say? What did I do? Um, and inside this feeling of just uh, desperation and sadness and hopelessness. Um, as it progressed further, a couple things really um, sped the disorder along for me. And one was Katrina, um, which I know a lot of people in here can relate to. And in this area, you can probably relate more to Rita. I came out a lot to this area um, after that hurricane and they felt very ignored because all the focus was on Katrina. Uh, so I know um, there's similar experiences with that. But when, um, when Katrina happened and, and um, I evacuated with my then husband, um, that's when I started drinking every day. So before that, I was just a weekend kind of person. And I looked forward to the weekend um, with eager anticipation. Um, and then I spent Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday recovering from the weekend. Um, and then I'd be really excited because it was Thursday and I could drink because that's what people did on Thursday afternoons. And then the whole cycle would repeat. When Katrina happened, that's when I started drinking every day. And in the beginning, I was in great company. You know, there are statistics that show, we know that the population of New Orleans was about a third, but the alcohol sales, the amount that went into the city, tripled. So, what, six times is the average? I, I was probably 20 times. I took, up, took some, of the, some of the slack up for the people that, that weren't keeping up. Um, but so uh, my plan was that when I came back to New Orleans, I would go back to not drinking every day. And um, that did not happen. And that was a surprise to me, that I seemed to have lost the ability to choose um, whether I drank or not. And um, as time went on, because this is a progressive disease, um, the drinking got worse and it got more, more common. Um, that happens with all substance use disorders. So remember that a substance use disorder, it, it exists on a spectrum. In the, in the early stages with the mild substance use disorder, that person may just need to have a bad night and, and wake up and say, whew, I don't wanna do that again. And then they either don't drink again or they moderate their drinking. Let's say we're a little further along that spectrum. A person might need to come in and see a counselor a few times. A person may even need to go to um, an outpatient treatment center, may need to talk to some people, go to some meetings, things like that. And again, easily able to moderate or um, stop the substance use. But once a person gets towards the end of that substance use disorder to the severe spectrum and then into the disease of addiction, which again, some people are, are born with, even before the first substance that that, that disease exists, um, the power of choice is really gone. Um, and, that's, and that's where I was. So the next thing then that really pivoted for me was that my husband and I got separated. And um, you know, Katrina was a really hard time. We went through a lot of tough stuff. And so when we were no longer together, I didn't have to hide my drinking anymore. Um, and so that's when, again, it really ramped up. And um, towards the end, I was in such a state of hopelessness and desperation that um, it's hard to describe. And one morning I woke up and the feeling of um, incomprehensible demoralization was within me. And I said to myself, I, I can't do this anymore. You know, I'm either gonna have to find out, I'm gonna have to figure out a way to stop drinking or I'm gonna have to figure out a way to not feel like this anymore or I'm gonna have to figure out a way to die. And I thought, you know, if I were my own client, what would I recommend? And this thought came to me, and you'd think it's just the most profound thing in the world. It sounds ridiculous, but it sort of was. The thought came to me, I wonder if I stopped drinking, I'd feel better. Seriously. 
And so I, I got out my computer and I sent uh, an email to the only person I knew who was in recovery. Because people in recovery, a lot of them, they don't talk about being in recovery, right? We just hear about people who drink too much or boy, that person really needs to stop drinking, whatever. People in recovery need to speak up. We need to make our voices heard. I promise you there's people in this room who are in recovery, who are in long-term sustained recovery. You need to make your voices heard. I, said, I reached out to her and, um, I'm get emotional. I reached out to her and I said, hey, would you ever be willing to talk to me about the alcohol thing? And um, she wrote back, I think maybe 45 seconds later. And uh, she said, yeah, when, you know? Tonight? And I was like, well, not tonight. Good Lord, no. I mean, like, Thursday is what I said. How about Thursday? And so um, she came over Thursday, and um, she told me about a treatment center that she had gone to, an outpatient treatment center. And, you know, I just had that gift of desperation. And I said, um, I'll do whatever it takes. And so I called them, and um, that was a Friday. And the program started on Monday, and it was Monday through Thursday, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., so I had a weekend to get through. And um, that was the longest weekend of my life, you know. And so she said, what do you want? You know, I'm here for you. And, um, and I said, let's go to a movie. Now, keep in mind, I thought I hated the movies. What I didn't like was that they didn't revolve around alcohol. As a matter of fact, I love movies. I'm a huge movie fan. Um, I love the Oscars. I love all of that. So she said, um, oh, well, such and such is playing at Canal Place, which is the, um, the movie theater in New Orleans that they have, like, meals and all of that and so um, she said what about you know this movie at Canal Place and I went we can't go there I mean they have a bar there and she blew me away with what she said after that she goes oh right I forgot and I went you forgot what do you mean you forgot because what I thought recovery meant and sobriety meant was that I would be like this not drinking for the rest of my life I did not know that my disease going into remission because I had the right treatment and intervention, I didn't know that that meant alcohol wasn't a problem for me anymore. I just didn't think about it. I don't think about it. It really doesn't cross my mind. It crosses my mind when I come out and talk about stuff like this, but I don't think about it anymore. You know, so what we need to do is put people into remission because no one can do this for the rest of, of their life. Um, this is not about willpower. Um, it's not about choice for a certain extent. Um, Senator Cassidy, you mentioned, you know, what do you do if someone goes out there and, and kills someone or, or, or does something, you know, that's, that's criminal? Um, and I feel like there's a difference between um, a reason and an excuse. So there is really no excuse for that. And there does need to be consequences for that. But the reason behind is the disease, the disease of addiction. So I can't have a disease and also have it be a choice. And people start to now are understanding that it is a disease, but they still think it's a choice. Like I went to the store to buy a substance use disorder. I'm gonna pick this one. This is what I wanna do. You go out on the streets and you ask people with that severest form of a substance use disorder, do they want to keep doing what they're doing? Is this what they chose to do when they, when, they grew, when they grew up? Is this what they wanted to be? Not one person out there is going to say that. Nobody wants that. It's a miserable life. They're there because they have a disease. There's no other reason they want to be out there. And again, I'm going to keep saying this, but with the right treatment, with the right interventions, we can get those people off the street and get them becoming productive members of society again. Um, so I entered recovery, and my notes here. So I'm out of time. Okay. Um, I'll say one last thing. Um, we looked at the list of, of organizations that um, we feel it's important to pull in in order to address the opioid crisis um, and the substance use disorder crisis. And there's an there's a organization and there's a community that is almost never represented. It's never on those slides. It's never really asked, asked to participate. 
usually, and that's the recovery community. And I promise you that two years from now, if you pull the recovery community in on this, you're going to see a way bigger change than if you don't. They are woefully underrepresented. And that's not just the fault because the policymakers are politicians. That's not it. That's part of it. The other part is that we need to speak up. You get 24 million people who are in recovery, who are in long-term sustained recovery. You get all those people, and you say, this is not OK. This is, this is a treatable disease. It changes overnight. People in recovery can help people with the disorder better in a different way than anyone else can. You know, if I have breast cancer and I go see a breast cancer doctor, I don't really think, hey, did you have breast cancer too? But if I'm suffering with a substance use disorder, I want to know, do you know how I feel? Because if you know how I feel, I'm going to listen to you a lot more than someone else. Um, we had a counselor, we had three counselors at the program that I went to. Two of them were in recovery, one just never had the disorder. And he was wonderful, he was great. Um, but I had heard uh, George, George W. Bush um, talk one time, who is in long-term recovery. And he talked about um, how he thought about alcohol every day. And it hit me, wow, I do that. Um, and I was telling him, you know, every, any word you could think of, I could bring back to the substance, any word. There wasn't one word he could throw out there that I wouldn't be able to bring. He said, oh, come on. Now, the two other counselors that were in recovery were like, mm-hmm, they were laughing like, yeah, duh, tell us something we don't know. Um, but the guy, he's like, come on, I can think of a word. I was like, any word, throw it out, doesn't matter. And he goes, cilantro. And I went, guacamole margarita. <laughs> we can understand in ways that other people who don't have the disorder can't understand. So let's bring the recovery community in on this. You know, let's, let's let us lead. There are things that'll work that only we can understand. And with the treatments that are tailored to the right person, we can really make a difference. Thank you. Jennifer, thank you for your courage to share everything with us. And just from hearing you talk, I've learned a lot. So thank you for being here. Well, now we'll, we'll visit with our panelists. And we're going to make this very wide open, and we're going to make it very informal. And I guess I just wanted to get a few opening comments, especially for Senator Cassidy. Uh, but Senator, since you, you've last left and gone to Washington, D.C., we have in the last few years passed some legislation in Louisiana. Uh, one of the pieces of legislation we passed was that any prescribing physician or APRN or dentist would have a, a limited quantity amount on the first prescription. And it, unless it's a chronic disease, it would be a, a seven-day supply. Uh, we've gotten a lot more engaged in the prescription monitoring program where we're highly encouraging physicians to use that, and Dr. Collado may talk about that later. And we're also encouraging uh, continuing education for prescribers. So we're working on different things. So I guess kind of two parts to start with you. Dr. Cassidy, but the first thing is we all know in, in government there's more need than resources. So from your perspective as, as we see this, what do you think is the trade-off? What, what do you think, I guess, Senator, from a, a, a prioritization standpoint and a resource allocation standpoint, kind of address it from your vantage point? First, you've got to do the most with what you have. Now, Fred, I was of aware of some of the things the state legislature and Dr. Gee have done. And if you look, um, if we have a prescription, if there is a prescription drug monitoring program that is tracking the, the, the narcotic prescriptions and other controlled substance prescriptions that are being written, and it's not being used to see which physicians are outliers. It's not being shared with law enforcement in order to swoop in on a pharmacy which is doing um, uh, overfilling or a physician who is overprescribing. Then what in the heck do we have the PDMP for? That's, that's exactly right. 
so before we speak about more money, we should speak about using those resources which we have and using them most effectively. Uh, and I've, I've, I've um, spoken to folks in D.C. about the wonderful things our state has done. I think there's only eight states that proactively share PDMP data with law enforcement. We are one of the eight. And they spoke about the physician community and other states resisting, and I gather that our physician community has been incredibly supportive. And so that is a good thing. Now, that said, if you notice, even though we have a nice graph showing fewer opioid prescriptions per population, we have an increased number of drug deaths. So that, le that what appears to be happening as legal opioids are falling off, it is being backfilled with illegal opioids. Now, if you're doing a sequential issue, then first you're going to do PDMP, physician, dentist, et cetera, education, but you're going to recognize that when an addict is an addict, she is going to, he is going to find another way to fill that urge, and they may be going now to street trucks. Yes, sir. So I think you can almost sequence that up to where at that point you begin to look more at law enforcement. Uh, so, so, but it takes a kind of global viewpoint of this, and it takes somebody being willing to give up resources they have if it turns out that the epidemic has passed them by and is now somebody else's goal. That takes local leadership. I'll finish by saying this. Federal government just shoves money down. It takes state and local leadership to use it wisely. And sometimes if the federal government is putting money and there's not state and local leadership, it's like rain on concrete. It just runs off and nothing has changed. So congrats to you, to you, to you, to you for trying to think about how to make the available federal resources work for our state in particular. Um, and, and the specific trade-off is just going to be at what phase in the epidemic you are. Senator, thank you for not only those words, but I saw you taking notes, and for you to take notes, I know you're, you're taking some of that information and seeing how you can implement it. We want to thank you so much. And there'll be a lot more to be said. Any of the panelists wanted to jump in on, the, on that first, the first aspect we brought out? Because we did talk about resource allocation and prioritizing the allocation and realizing there's, there's so many resources that we have so much need for. I guess, uh, Madam Secretary, I'll jump to you right now. And, you know, we, we talk about addiction, we talk about recovery, we talk about the whole aspect of it. Why don't you globally just talk about the whole addiction issue? Well, I think no one could do it more eloquently than Jennifer just did. I, I've uh, really learned a lot from you, and I think, um, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is that I, a lot of folks are surprised when we say that this is a long-term problem. You know, it's not just methadone for a day, and I know a company's going around saying, I have an injection, it's just two months and you're done. No. For most people, that's not the case. There is no easy fix to this disease. Um, for many, it will be a lifelong issue. And so I think that's what Jennifer actually, because we've been working together and talking for months, as she taught me that, uh, to really think about that and to think differently about this disease. And I think the more, I mean, particularly in New Orleans, it's insane. I mean, I, I got the Girl Scouts Award last week. We were, they were drinking at 11 a.m. I mean, I'm sorry, I mean, the, the only time I've gotten in really big trouble, well, I get in really big trouble a lot, but the, one of the first times I got in really big trouble here was when I went to a committee and I mentioned the public health impact of a drive through daiquiri with a straw in it and maybe that wasn't a good idea to drive and drink that. And you would have thought that I had, you know, I had said the saints were, you know, I was a, I don't know, a, a, I mean, you just, this was the end of the world, and it was the front page article in the Times Picayune. You can't talk about <laughs> drinking. And, you know, every event we go to, and, you know, and so you think about this in Louisiana, this is a big problem, and particularly with alcohol. Obviously, opioids are, that's another thing Jennifer taught me, is this is, it's pick your poison. You have this disease. It could be alcohol, it could be opioids you are dealing with an addiction gene and it depends on what's available and but i think we all need to do some soul searching in this state too about the culture and of course the food is great and drinking is great and all this but do we really need to begin events at 11 a.m drinking and this kind of thing i mean i know it's culture and it's fun but i think we it's it's tough and i think i raise i'm raising five children in new orleans and i think a lot about exposure i was raised mormon and the best thing about being raised Mormon is that 
I did not get exposure to any of this. I mean, it was it was very much a Pollyanna universe, and it was a lot easier for me to grow up and not have these issues just because I didn't have to deal with them. So I think we have to think about the state and how we change culture towards health, not that we can't party and enjoy. There's a time and a place, but it shouldn't be every day, certainly not at 11 on a Thursday, um, that we need to be drinking. So I think you know, that's a challenge. Um, as a Utah-born secretary to be talking about this because it can't come from me because it has to come from you and we have to think about um, the other piece of it is that so many people are um, in recovery and that they often don't talk and they shouldn't be embarrassed this, this stigma is a huge part of this there's so many people um, in my family I'm sure in your family who stopped drinking who did recover but when they don't talk about it they don't tell their story then there's no support network. So I would be interested in hearing from the audience about how you think we draw people out. Is it in the faith community? Is it, how do, how do we do this better? Because I agree, we're bringing all these groups together talking about it. I'm meeting with this, the Students Against Drunk Driving next week and so on, but we're not bringing folks to the table and they could be people in our own workplace. So just, I thought, you know, anyone in the audience have an idea, how could we engage a little bit more in honest discussions um, and to say this is not a failure this is a disease you may have it there's no shame in that how do we help each other any thoughts and I do see so many different yeah. disciplines here you know after we finish we you, you, the secretary will be here to visit because I think the challenge we have in something like, like I'd ask her to address more is there are so many different programs out there faith-based community-based government-based from your vantage point, how do you see us integrating so many programs? Because you work with DCFS, you have so many programs in LDH, you have so many faith-based groups that come. How do you foresee the integration of it? I think the, one of the big issues, and we're actually working, talking, getting back to coding, working with Code for America on a project in this vein. You, vulnerable individuals are vulnerable individuals, end of story. The same individual who is vulnerable for not being able to evacuate for a hurricane is the individual who is vulnerable for housing and for security, for food insecurity, is the same individual who has neighborhood violence impact, is the same individual who may not fill his or her insulin. So all of those things come together to create vulnerability but we're not using our infrastructure back to Senator Cassidy's point to the maximum extent you may that same vulnerable family may have a social services coordinator may go to the food stamps program may have a managed care care coordinator and so on and so forth they never talk and so you have all these funding streams that are going to support this family, but none of them are connected, and so they're not additive. And so one of the things we're looking at with Code for America, and would be interesting to talk with this group about, is how do we leverage that data and connect it so that we really have a better picture of a vulnerable family. We understand what services they're getting, so A, we don't duplicate and waste money, and B, we know where the real gaps are. Very good. Dr. Collado, we're going to talk to you a little bit. For those of you that don't know it, Dr. Collado is the executive director for the Board of Medical Examiners. So, Dr. Collado, from your vantage point, just, just talk a little bit about, from your vantage point and the different physicians out there, just the stigma of this, what the Board of Medical Examiners is doing, what do you see from your vantage point? Because each of these panelists and so many people here see something from their vantage point. Talk a little bit about from where you sit and you've practiced and you're now in, the, in an administrative position. Address a little bit of that. Well, the, the Board of Medical Examiners is named that not because we're the Quincy's of the world, but because we were the original testers in giving the examination. And we still specify that examination, though we don't give it anymore. But what we see from this vantage point is we have patients who are overdosed and they become complaints to the board about prescribers. We see prescribers who are addicted. We see prescribers who are improperly prescribing. And our goal at the Board of Medical Examiners has always been, when it comes to the physician issue, is to rehabilitate, return to work, prevent recidivism, because this is too valuable a resource to waste. When it comes to the patients, we owe them a duty to investigate complaints, to develop complaints from other agencies, and be able to respond to the issues so that we can prevent deaths by diagnosing physicians who have problems. 
To that end, the State Medical Society and the Board of Medical Examiners have put together a physician's health program, a PHP. And we've even gone so far as to say if you're part of a PHP, you don't have to answer positive to addiction questions or other substance abuse questions on reapplication forms. So let me we ask you a question. Good, I'd like for y'all to jump in. That's what we're going to do. So when I had a, I was at an opioid round table in Alexandria, the question is, and I, I posed this earlier, if you have a young person, or not an old young person, who is, goes into treatment for addiction and later has a pre-employment form to fill out, have you abused drugs? How do they answer that? If they answer positively, they may not get the job. If they answer negatively and they later, they may get fired. You see where I'm going with that. Okay. Yes. So let's talk about an initial application for a physician. And we know that right now in the United States, physicians have a, approximately a 2.7 time increase over the baseline population for depression and suicide. But if an initial applicant says to us, yes, I was treated for depression and substance abuse in the past, that yes question would trigger us to interview that physician and not just automatically grant that license. We want to see that he is truly in recovery, that he's been through an, a, a program, and he stayed some, in a sober position. If it's a reapplication, and they are part of a PHP that they self-reported and joined, they don't even have to say yes to us. We would never know. And so we've tried to make it easy for them and not stigmatize them. We have a duty to know about it. We have a duty to make sure that they're healthy. And I think that's how we fulfill it. But then you get doctors that just don't want to do it. So you'll understand what the magnitude of this problem could be. We get anywhere from 11 to 1,400 complaints or reports that we develop into complaints about physicians and their improper practice every year. We close 96% of them with no action at all. We have about 44 major disciplinary actions every year for the last several years. It averages about 44. And of those 44, I would think it's safe to say two-thirds of them are related to drugs, whether it's improper prescribing, improper using, or both. And we sometimes have to take, require special treatment. Now, it's much harder to treat physicians, professionals, airline pilots, and things like that than it is the average population. So they need a different course of treatment. If you weed out all of the treatment centers, very few of them handle professionals with substance abuse or other issues. And I think that's been a bigger problem for us to find the right places to send it because it takes longer. Because they are sometimes going to go back to prescribing or in this life-threatening or the life-impacting stresses of practicing medicine. So again, we do our best to get them in these programs, get them out of these programs and return them to work. Sometimes it takes a little suspension to get their attention. The biggest problem we have is when we do take some of these public actions and you're free to go to our website at lsbme.la.gov and you can see all of the public actions we take. But we feel the very problem we have more than anything else is once the insurance companies find out about it, they drop them from their panels. Dr. Gee and the people at Medicaid have been very good about keeping these physicians in the panels and helping them to continue to practice. But it's still a problem because other insurance companies don't want them. We have to work with hospitals to make sure that they understand they're in recovery and the importance of getting them back to work. And sometimes we get criticized because we put them to work in the prisons where it's very needed for them to work. These are not unlicensed physicians. They have a license that has a restriction on it. For example, they can't prescribe any narcotic substances. But they can practice. So these are the things we try and do, and that's what it looks like to us. And of course, you know, we we're always battling to be able to protect the public. Thank you very much. I, I guess I'd throw this out to Dr. Cassidy and Dr. Collada. Do you, do you think physicians are getting it more that the overprescribing of opioids and, you know, if you, you go for a toothache, you don't need 90, you could use seven. Do you, do you think they're getting it? Um, I know that from personal experience that some dentists and physicians and others have stamps that just here's your prescription and that stamp is more than you should be receiving um, and so there is an increased awareness 
a seven day limit or a three day limit or CDC putting out safe harbor guidelines helps. But for many folks, it's one of those things kind of like, and I'm speaking to an OB, it's kind of like if you do a C-section too soon, you may not see it, but sooner or later there's a baby that ends up in the NICU that wouldn't ordinarily. So sometimes you don't see it in your own practice, you don't think you do. But if you look at it statistically, if you overprescribe opioids, someone's going to end up in an attic. Uh, there's a professor at LSU, son was vibrant in Manhattan, New York, had a bike accident, given 38 prescription, and now his vibrant son in New York is living in his basement in Baton Rouge. So there is a genetic predisposition. So I, I, I say that because there is an advantage to having a global perspective where the legislature, the secretary of health, the head of board of medical examiners is saying, listen, you may not be seeing it because your practice is so small, but it's out there. And if you looked hard enough, you would. Uh, so yes, they're getting it, but that doesn't mean there should not be pressure from on top. That if you don't get it, you need to do it anyway. Just a side note, we, we are working on some legislation this session that was brought from the Attorney General's office. And, and that is from the standpoint when a hospice patient dies, many times there's a lot of scheduled drugs in, in, that, in that ownership. So we're working on, on with the hospice nurse to have a, a, a destruction program of the drugs immediately on site. Uh, we think that may be just one of the small tools that, that we can implement in there. Thank you all so much. Karen, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I guess the first one now we want to talk about prevention and, and educating the youth. Talk a little bit from your vantage point of how we can educate the youth with programs that are out there, what tips you can share with, with our audience. Thank you. So I don't think it's going to come as a surprise to anyone that the answer is involving multiple community organizations. I mean, that's kind of what we're doing here. Um, specifically mobilizing everyone who has a stake in reducing access to and availability of prescription drugs. Um, but what we often see is that the group comes together and they have a common goal and they're not quite sure what action items to take to get there. Um, SAMHSA, um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, has developed a framework to assist these groups. Um, it, it actually um, itemizes steps to take um, to galvanize a group, steps like do a needs assessment, build capacity, create your plan, implement, evaluate with details um, under all those steps. So if you get an organization, a group together, you have a starting place, which is often where people fumble. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is that when you're organizing these groups, there are some usual suspects that we always go to and need to be there, like law enforcement, youth representatives, parents and parent groups, schools. But there are also some organizations I want to bring your attention to that are important to, um, to include around this particular topic. Um, I know you heard from Dr. Bo Clark. Um, Baton Rouge is fortunate because we have a very active coroner, but they can bring a wealth of information around this topic if you include them into your organization. Um, I also wanted to make sure people were aware that faith-based communities are so involved and that they bring a lot, um, they have a lot to offer. I um, also wanted to point out insurance companies and businesses. I know our own Healthy Louisiana plans will often participate on a local level and have a lot of resources to bring. Um, and in that um, process of bringing these people together and you need kind of some outcomes, what are we going to do, what are our output, there are some kind of emerging topics around educating communities through these groups. Um, for example, um, uh, bringing awareness of what opioids are. Uh, most people don't know what they are, and so education campaigns, uses of um, tools like the warn me labels that you can get on the back of your insurance card. Um, so when you go to the pharmacist, if you have this label on the back of your card, the pharmacist will let you know, you know this is an opioid, right? Um, just for more information and things like that. And I, I know we're short on time, but I wanted to mention two websites that have a lot of really great information. Um, one is the National Safety Council, has a whole page on opioids. It has a lot of good information for parents and how to speak to their children, tips for parents on how to um, help avoid um, having their children fall into dangers of using um, kind of surplus opioids in the house. And they also have the access to the warn me lab labels. And then also the SAMHSA website, samhsa.gov, has a lot of useful information as well.
Thank you very much. Before we get to our next round of panelists, and we're going to call some of you back up, is there anything that we didn't get a chance to talk about that you'd like to bring up to the group? I just want to say that every physician in the state of Louisiana, every podiatrist, every DO, and every PA, along with the dentist, are taking a course. Three hours is specified from the legislation that Senator Mills passed last year. And they will not be able to, at least on our board, and we regulate physicians, podiat podiatrists, DOs, and PAs, they will not be able to continue prescribing after the 2019 license renewal if they do not take this online three-hour course. And it has to do with recognition of addiction, more importantly, recognition of diversion, treatment of addiction, and proper prescribing practices when it comes to opioids. So we're putting the downward pressure. We do have a few yelps and screams, but along the way it's been widely accepted. And one thing that I've been, again, grappling with, and, and Vince helped me, uh, going back to my question, how do you help the young person who you don't want his record or her record tarnished so they never can get a job, but you also want to make sure there's a consequence. So I ask him what they do for physicians. It's a three to four month inpatient at a minimum, and they're under monitoring with urine drug screening, I'm assuming, for one to three years. And at that point, they can say that they, they do not have to report that they've had an addiction problem. So that may be the way to do it, but I'm not sure very many insurance companies are paying for three to four months at a minimum uh, inpatient drug treatment programs for those who need it. Yeah. And um, the gentleman I spoke to earlier, whose 17-year-old son died, was told two weeks after he was put in inpatient to discharge him. So um, anyway, so it may be an answer, but it's an expensive answer. Thank you all so much. We'll be calling you back. So y'all can take a, a little break on that. And uh, as our secretary was talking about, you know, drinking on a Thursday at 11 o'clock, it reminds me of a story. I had a cardiologist that moved, that I got to know well in around Lafayette. And I said, what brought you from New York City to Lafayette? He said, it's crackling in Boudin. He said, I'm have a lot of business. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you. So we'll call up our next panelist, the Honorable Judge Blair Edwards, Attorney General's Office, Randy Hennigan, Jennifer Holmes, who we met earlier, and Lee Jones with the USDA. Thank you all for being here. We'll start with our, our next round of questioning. Thank you all. all. I'll start with uh, Judge Edwards. Judge Edwards, let's talk a little bit about drug court, law enforcement, all of the opportunities out there, and kind of the transition from, you know, incarceration to being out there with the public, and also just some of the programs out there and some of the challenges you see. Um, one of the largest challenges I see, I do two juvenile drug courts, um, and I do exclusive juvenile, um, and what I see is I do, uh, child protection cases so and delinquency cases. And what I can honestly say is that every delinquency case, almost without fail, should have been a child protection case that was gone undetected or unnoticed, which could probably have been detected through a truancy program, um, a very intensive truancy program. And what I have noticed is that while we have juveniles in our juvenile drug court program, it is, we now have gone to uh, duly adjudicating um, a family in needs of services to give jurisdiction over the family because it is not just one person or one thing that has caused this to be a substance use disorder. And so um, much of what we are finding is that in order to be able to treat the child, the family, the addict, you have to understand the problem um, and the symptoms of the problem, and you have to be trauma-informed. So you cannot just treat addiction. Addiction by itself is the result of a problem. And so in order to treat the addiction, we have to look to what is causing the problem. However, some people are predisposed. Um, my younger brother was and had a story, unfortunately ended up uh, a very violent um, ending, but 
a very happy ending as well. Um, was in a car accident. Um, some, it was a fatal accident for the other driver um, who did nothing wrong. <clears throat> and my brother ended up having to go away, go to the Texas house, go, I mean, it was, it was a long, drawn out journey. He's clean for nine years, he has twins, he's raising his nine year old. It is an amazing story. Um, however, the problem is, or one of the things I see as a barrier to being able for any service to be, is that when we look at the opioid epidemic, <clears throat> they say, wow, the United States, it's crazy. It absolutely is, and when you take a global approach, and I mean really global approach, and in what I do, I have done a lot of research. <clears throat> in Japan, they don't have this problem. In Europe, they don't have this problem, and you say, so why not? Do, are people not predisposed to addiction over there? And here's the issue. Um, insurance companies do not cover opioids in those places. 50% of their doctors are writing prescriptions, whereas 91% are writing prescriptions here. They're not writing prescriptions for every time you go to the, the emergency room. And our doctors are not wrong in what they're doing. They have every right, it's legal, they're not, it's not, I mean, some may be over-prescribing, but they have to have an acute illness, and I have so many parents that come in, and I've had many parents, they come in and their words are slurring as we're in drug court. They're, it always goes, but, but I have a prescription. Yeah. They trust their doctors. And so the barriers, I think, to treatment in one regard is that we have to take a look at what is our tolerance level as a community is it in an estate do you realize that our state that we write more prescriptions per resident than we have residents. in the state that we have residents and so i think those are alarming statistics that we need to look at in japan they only write it if you have an acute symptom and if you are terminally ill and so when we are providing um, drug, uh, inst when we go to treatment centers and I send a child to a treatment facility, they only cover 28 days. That's enough to maybe get someone clean from marijuana when you're a child. And so we're spending the money, our, our insurance comp companies are covering the cost for the, the drugs but they're not covering the cost of the treatment. And in Louisiana, I think the study showed in 2009 from Columbia University, uh, for every dollar that we spend for substance abuse, we spend three cents for treatment, for prevention treatment, and 97 cents for consequences and incarceration. Seems to me like that needs to be flipped. Let's take care of the problem because a Band-Aid costs way more. It costs $50,000 a year to incarcerate an adult. It costs almost 100,000 a year to incarcerate a juvenile. And we spend on true education in the public school system, 11,000 a year on educating a child. These numbers are extremely skewed. So I think it's just, we have to look at what our level of tolerance are, is. Are we willing to say, okay, insurance companies, cover us taking all these drugs. Cover the prescriptions, but then yet they don't cover the treatment. Drug courts work, but there's a lack of funding. There is a lack of funding, and certainly you have to have consequences and all of these things, but it, yet it doesn't matter. We don't have the funds to incarcerate, yet alone to have drug courts. I get threatened every year that they're going to take away and cut my drug court program. I have one of the largest juvenile drug court programs in the state. We work through treatment with trauma. We work with the parents. And yet I say, what about a truancy program? 
And people say, oh, they're just missing school. No, no, they're missing school for a reason. And when you get into the home of a kindergartner and a third grader, that's where you can make a difference for treatment for the parents so that the child doesn't follow in the cycle. And so I think those are things that we have, but we don't, and another thing that we don't have, you try to find a treatment facility for a female. Try to find a treatment facility for a female. And then look at the cost that we're incurring to place a child into foster care. So the treatment needs to be there. We are limited in our state. We are limited in our funds. But we sure are shelling out the money to pay for prescription opioids. And we're sure shelling out the money to incarcerate our, our society members. We've got to get and look, and I, I beg everyone, and we will be doing a documentary. Look at the re-entry program for Angola. That's one of the most amazing programs in the nation, people. Right here, we got that right. But you know how long they have to stay in there in the program? For two years. Two years. Because they have treatment, they have education, they have separation, and then you know what? They're taxpayers. It works. It does work. But we've got to draw the line in the sand for what we're willing to accept and tolerate. And as a juvenile judge, I am not willing to accept and tolerate going to another funeral for a child in my court. I'm not willing to accept it. I'm not willing to accept insurance telling me they are not gonna pay for treatment for a child. So we've really gotta draw the line in the sand. Treatment works if you have the money and the places to treat and treat the problem. Treatment is not an incarceration at $50,000 and $100,000 a year because they're getting out. Thank you, Thank you very much. And everyone, let's, you know, I, I see different disciplines of, of different fields, like I see the Human Service District is here. As, as you hear the panelists speak and everybody really knows each other here, reach out to one another if those resources can be integrated or if you've heard something that the light bulb goes off and, and you can work with Judge Edwards. Think, think it through because that's another thing that we'll learn a lot today but hopefully we can network a lot today. So thank you so much and your words are so well said. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna turn the page now and we're gonna go to uh, the Attorney General's office, Mr. Randy Hennigan. Talk a little bit to us about naloxone and the program that the Attorney General's office developed because it's very quite unique and I think it's probably one of a kind in the United States. Uh, talk a little bit about that and let's talk about maybe just from your perspective, from your vantage point, what's working, what's not working. And uh, thank you for being here. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, Naloxone or Narcan, as most people know it, is the basically the antidote for an opioid o overdose. Um, it is a chemical that basically stops the receptors uh, from the opioid uh, addiction. Okay, it blocks the pain. It blocks the opioids block the pain, and Narcan does just the opposite. It, it breaks it loose. Okay. Um, the Attorney General's office received a settlement from Pfizer several years ago, and part of this settlement was that Pfizer agreed to allow the Attorney General's office to provide Narcan to first responders. This program is done through uh, our office where a f agency can contact them. They will receive a request document. They fill it out. If they fit the requirements, they will give them vouchers for 10 Narcan units. Um, these units are free of charge. They will go to a pharmacy in their local area and receive the, the Narcan units. 
they mostly are used by fire department EMS. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, police agencies who have contacted us, but mainly it's been fire departments and EMS. It's been very successful. I believe we've done over 2,000 different units that we've given out. Uh, it is free of charge to the agencies. There is no cost to them at all. Uh, Narcan is becoming more and more available to the public. Now, most of the major chains will give it, I say give it, they will sell it to a person without a prescription. Uh, some of it is very expensive, some of it is cheaper, but there's drawbacks to that also. There's a lot of people believe that all you're doing is enabling people. It's giving the people the thought that I don't have to worry about overdosing, I've got this. Um, there are, whenever we dealt with prescription drug abuse, they would call farming parties. They would, people would come in, they'd have a big glass bowl, they just drop pills in it. You brought pills, you would bite it in, everybody just took pills. They are now starting uh, Narcan parties. Everybody come in, as long as somebody's got Narcan, everybody parties. Oh my goodness. Um, it is a horrible thing to think about, but it's there. Um, this is an issue that law enforcement, EMS, fire department, and everybody has to deal with. Because you go to a party and there's people with 10 Narcans and there's 100 people there. What you gonna do with the other 90? We will have to deal with them, all of us. Healthcare, law enforcement, everybody will. Um, I think Narcan is a wonderful thing, but it's just like a lot of opioids. Oxycontin was a wonderful drug for the people who needed it. Chronic, severe pain, it is a wonderful drug until it got abused and it opened the floodgates. People get addicted to prescription pain pills or anything else, and it progressively moves on. For law enforcement, it's actually moved on into the aspect of just like every other drug. It moves on into heroin. Heroin has gotten extremely potent, and it's gotten extremely cheap. Heroin used to be very expensive, and not everybody would use it. Number one, they had the stigma of the needles. Now nobody cares about needles anymore. For whatever reason, everybody don't care about them. They're using heroin. Heroin is getting laced with fentanyl. Fentanyl is a horrible thing when misused. Uh, fentanyl is transdermal, and that becomes an issue for law enforcement and first responders again. It will affect you in a matter of seconds, and it does not take more than just a couple of grains of salt to kill you. Car fentanyl is even worse. This is a, a problem that everybody has, not just law enforcement, not just first responders, because if you work in a hospital and somebody is brought in and they have fentanyl on their body somewhere and you touch them, you just became contaminated with it. That means everybody in this room can be contaminated very easily. It is a horrible thing that people are making. They're making this in their homes just like they did meth. The biggest part of the opioid addiction has become when people get hurt. They can be in a car wreck, anything else, they go to a doctor. Doctor gives them medication. Like I said, the opioid blocks the pain. It does not solve it. A pill is not gonna solve a problem. It's gonna block it. They get addicted to it and it becomes, it progressively gets worse. Uh, I don't remember who said it, but one of them on the first panel, I think it was Dr. Gee said, uh, no, I'm sorry, Jennifer said, People don't start out, they don't wake up that day saying, I want to be an addict. It becomes that way. Um, everybody has the possibility of becoming an addict. Some people are more likely to be it, but everybody has that possibility to, to anything. The opioid addiction has begot, became such a huge thing. I was reading last night, Judge uh, Edwards just said that the Americans has such a wide range of it compared to every, everywhere else in the world. I think I read last night, 80% of all opioid prescriptions are written in America. That means 80% in the world. There's another statistic that I found a little while back. The Vietnam War was approximately 20 years. In the Vietnam War, there was 58,220 Americans killed. In 2016, there was six, over 62,000 Americans killed through opioids. In one year, we lost more Americans than we did in 20 years in a war. 
that's a horrible thing to think about, and it's just astounding to think about that. Um, to me, the Narcan is working, uh, but it has its drawbacks. It's just like everything else. I think um, the treatment centers are the best way we're going to get any help for the, the people addicted. Uh, it, it is something that no one thing is going to fix. It's going to take everybody working together to do it. It's not just the doctors that's going to cause the problem. It's not just the doctors that's going to solve it. It's a lot of people working together. Thank you so much. And you've given us so much food for thought. And, and, and I think it makes it for the next segue. Um, Mr. Jones, Mr. Lee Jones, could you let, let's talk about a successful model, the mobile treatment clinics and how we can all partner up. Tell us a little bit about that, please. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, I'm honored to be here today and uh, glad to be able to address you guys and talk a bit about uh, rural development's role in, in, in this battle uh, with this addiction. Um, you know, our, our eyes have been open today about all the problems and how horrible it is. I hope to be able to open equally open eyes uh, in relation to the resources that are available. Uh, so some of the, I'll talk just uh, quickly about the resources in terms of the programs that are being offered through rural development and then segue a bit into some of the successful models that are taking place across the country. Um, one of those things that we talk about is the distance learning and telemedicine grant uh, that, that Betty Ann talked about a bit earlier and it was designed uh, with the notion that it was designed to provide access to education as well as health care in rural communities where it otherwise may not have been available. Uh, now, it's, we, we have such a focus on opioid uh, recovery and addiction that uh, a lot of that money is being set aside now to address addiction and treatment. And uh, as with any other grant that you apply for, of course, there are points that are awarded, and that's how it's determined how you, um, you know, how successful you are in applying for, in approaching that. Uh, there are points that are available for those that are addressing opioids. Um, so we want to make sure that you're aware of that. But in addition to that, um, you know, the community facilities program offered through USDA Rural Development is, is readily available, and it's designed to do those innovative things such as rural treatment facilities, uh, such as in Pennsylvania where um, they are doing mobile treatment facilities using RVs or, or tractor trailers or things like that. And those are the innovative ideas that we are looking for and looking for opportunities to fund. Um, as, as much as we like doing the police cars and the fire trucks in the rural communities, um, and, and those are necessary, don't get me wrong, we are looking for those innovative ideas and those opportunities to fund those kind of facilities. Those of you that um, are, are, are in and drive through rural communities, and even urban settings for that matter, but if you're driving through a rural community, you probably often see vacant facilities, vacant buildings that are there and, and available for use. And if you ask that mayor, they're going to say that that needs to be used for the next manufacturing facility that's going to solve all their unemployment woes. But that's not, you know, that's not always a reality in, the, in these communities. But what might occur is such as in North Carolina where they used those vacant buildings to develop a family resource center. And that resource center was designed with, with, in my, with the idea in mind that opioids are, that's a family addiction. Uh, addictive uh, disorders in general are family family addiction, family disorders. So that treatment facility was set aside in order to address family resources, bringing in the entire family, mom, dad, brother, sister, um, aunt, uncle, and, and the like, to have an opportunity to talk about how we recover as a family, how we move forward, and, and, and rural development is there to be able to provide those resources. Thank you. I, I guess one follow-up question, because uh, there's so many of us here that who, who do you find the best strategic partners in a community to partner up with? Is it, is it the government sector? Is it the hospital? Or, you know, where would you say would be the best strategic partners to join forces with the programs? Well, I think uh, I think we're all. I mean, everyone in this room is 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 a, is a valuable partner. So whether it's the the, the hospitals, the even the urban setting, the hospitals and urban settings. I think about what um, Lafayette General is doing in this area, where they are really reaching out into the rural areas and doing a great job of uh, uh, not only revitalizing some of these rural hospitals that tend to struggle as from a resource perspective, uh, and then you bring in your you know your municipal your municipal officials, and it you know it, it really takes you know we used to have a saying in the in in the community that it takes a village to raise a child. It really takes a village to address this this issue as well. So I mean all of us play a role, and so whether we're approaching it from the perspective of having the funding that people need to to address this this disorder, or looking at the folks that can help identify those that need the treatment. You know I think uh, the what Jennifer spoke of earlier was extremely powerful in terms of uh, the people that are that are in long term recovery using their voices and speaking up as well. So I mean, you know, rural development is there to provide the funding, but we need the people with the ideas and the innovative tactics to, to come to bear and hope, hopefully we have an opportunity to work with them Thank to provide you, some Mr. of those Jones. services. Thank you so much. Jennifer, once again, your speech was inspiring and 
Now I guess we'd ask you, let, let's talk about access to treatment, you know, distance, transportation, just, just talk to us about all that and, and give us some insight from your vantage point. Um, well, you took away the first thing I was going to say, because the question they were going to ask me was, uh, what are the biggest hurdles preventing access to medication-assisted therapies? And um, I was going to do a gentle redirect pivot. I missed the dress uh, rehearsal. To, he I'm did sorry. it. He did it for me, which <laughs> is, that's the wrong question. The right question is, what are the um, biggest hurdles preventing access to the type of treatment that is going to work for the type of person who needs the help. Not one treatment is going to work for every single person. And it used to be the average person who actually got treatment would go into a treatment center and then they would uh, finish that program and they would say, go to AA, thank you, goodbye. Um, now I'm a fan of 12-step programs. I think they're wonderful. But not everyone likes them. They don't work for every single person. Um, why? I don't know. Um, and now what I'm noticing is that there's a shift away from, look, go check into these 12-step programs that are available 24 hours a day and are free and all of that, over to, let's just get you into some medication-assisted treatment, medication-assisted therapies. You know what? Those are wonderful too. Thank God we have them. But that's not the only solution here, and the solution is gonna be like what you talked about, which is it's a lot of different things, and it's people getting together and bringing their different areas of expertise and learning more about the disease of addiction. Um, and, um, you know, it's like breast cancer 20 years ago. Everyone got the same treatment, and a big group of people died. And now what we know is there's lots of different kinds. There's subgroups in there, and we can check for that, and we can tailor treatments, and survival rates have skyrocketed. And it's going to be the same thing with addiction, the more they study it and the more they know about it. Um, but specifically, what are some of the biggest hurdles? I'll get into some of the real nitty gritty ones, but, but the first one that I want to say that I think is huge is stigma. And we've got to change the way that we think about substance use disorders. Um, and there's a word that just makes my skin crawl, and everyone here is here for the right reason, so I hope it doesn't seem like I'm chastising anyone. There's two terms, and one of them is addict. When you hear the word addict, does anyone in here think of someone that looks like me? Or do you think about someone who's living under a bridge? Or someone who's stealing stuff? Or someone who's hurting people? I don't ever want to hear that word again. You know what we used to call people with developmental delays and people with special needs? We called them morons. That was a, that was a technical term, feeble-minded. Okay, so that word's got to go. And I mean, I wish Senator Cassidy was still here because he'd be like, oh God, there's that Jennifer Holmes again. I can't tell you how many times I have sent letters. The New York Times is so sick of me. The Washington Post, uh, I mean, I, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, there is a Surgeon General report that was released a couple years ago, and he uh, did a follow-up letter, and I think you can find it if you go to Surgeon General, the language we use when addressing addiction. <clears throat> and he talks about, um, you know, instead of saying addict, say a person with a substance use disorder. Yes. Huge difference. The other term that kills me is uh, substance abuse, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, because guess what else gets triggered in our brains when we hear that word? Uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse. You know, I wasn't abusing alcohol. Alcohol was abusing me. So I don't ever want to hear that term again, either one. You want to take one thing away from today? Don't use either one of those words. It's substance use disorder or a person with a substance use disorder. Um, there are, yes, lots of real specific hurdles as well, like finding providers. Medicaid, actually you get better coverage with Medicaid than you do with um, other insurance companies, but in order to find a provider, right now if you want to get into the Medicaid um, covered program in, in uh, Orleans Parish, there is a six week wait for, for an appointment. If you want to be a walk-in patient, there is a counselor that's available on Tuesdays from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. That's it. And those are the lucky people that get that. And then let's say they get that appointment, it's another month to two months before they can get in and see a doctor. Um, minuscule 
the amount of people that actually get that actually get coverage. Um, so I'll stop there. I could go on and on. Obviously. No, this was perfect, and we we learned a lot from you today, Jennifer. Not just one or two things. We've learned a lot from you. You know, we do we do have some time, and I think Senator Cassidy and, and the secretary did have to to, to leave. Because uh, if anybody's heading to Baton Rouge right now, the line goes all the way to uh, Maraguen. Um, so, so uh, while we, we do this, why don't, why don't we open it up if you could? Let, let's with, with the four panelists. Go ahead and open it up. Randy and I are sitting here on the panel. We have to go to Baton Rouge, so we'll be here a while. <laughs> you will. You might as well stay and have supper. Yeah, yeah, exactly, because I'll make the drive, and when I'm coming back from the capital, it's lined up for about 20 miles. I'd like to meet the engineer that designed I-10 to turn into one lane, wouldn't y'all? <laughs> Yo, why don't we, with the panelists, would y'all be okay to take a few questions from the audience? Sure, we don't have anything have any else to do but sit in traffic. Exactly, Judge. Um, let's open it up. Does anybody, uh, we have a wide variety of expertise on the panel sitting here. Does anybody have any questions or any thoughts that you have that you could maybe also integrate with, with your thoughts? I see we have the... Acadiana Human Service District here. I see we have different types of medical providers, rural health clinics. Anybody would like to bring something up that can either add information or, or challenge our... Uh, Senator, our can parents? I just say one thing? Oh, please. Jennifer just said something that I think is just unreal. Um, she's, you heard how hard it is for someone to get into those doctor's offices. And the one thing that is not hard, I can tell you with... Um, I hear this all the time. Um, I was not a personal injury attorney, but let me tell you, they have personal injury clients. They go into doctors, they are like clockwork. They go to the chiropractors, doctors show up, like, and they write prescriptions like this. It's amazing to me that it's easier to get a prescription for an opioid than it is to get into a doctor to see someone to help you prevent from being a substance to having a substance use disorder because you're pre because you have access so I said restrict the access because what they say in Japan is you don't have to have an opioid to treat your toothache you don't have an opioid to treat your ankle sprain and I can say that when my son was 15 he went to the emergency room for a concussion in a football game <clears throat> And as I sit there, we're getting ready to leave. And I think that's it. Until the, the nurse walks in the emergency room and says, here is a prescription. And granted, the doctor did not do anything wrong. Not anything wrong. But he did. He wrote a prescription for hydrocodone and muscle relaxers to my 15-year-old son. And I was astounded. And I tore it up right there and I said, is this going to fix the concussion? No, it's going to block the pain. So I'll give you Motrin when we get home. So I say that we can't get in to see the people to fix it or help us fix it. So why have the access to it? There's nothing wrong with pain. Thank, thank you. Anybody wants to? Yes, sir. Don't, don't worry about it, I'm loud. <laughs> and Fred, you know that. Exactly. Um, uh, Cian Robinson, uh, Executive Director, Lafayette General Foundation. Um, question for the panel. Uh, we are doing quite a bit, uh, given the rurality of our footprint, we're doing quite a bit with telemedicine. Okay? Uh, and thank you to the <laughs> USDA World Development Authority for helping us fund some of that with the schools. My question to you is, have you seen um, an effective solution that can be telemedically delivered um, given the that access seems to be such uh, a challenge yes ma'am well I don't know that there's any um, any one solution that that would be a catch-all obviously but uh, you know just just in terms of the examples uh, especially with uh, LGMC participating in the distance learning and telemedicine grant, you know, some of the opportunities that we've seen out there using that program, uh, there's opportunities in other states where, uh, where there's limited access to mental health services and, and, and the like. 
uh, inadequate insurance coverages, and they were using this telemedicine program to create a rural network that would uh, that, that covered almost a third of the particular state that I'm referring to. And I mean, they've been a frequent recipient of this distance learning and telemedicine program, and they're able to provide uh, you know comprehensive care in those high need communities. I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, say that you know, despite the fact that we're called rural development, it does not mean that we don't reach into urban communities. Um, in such cases, the distance learning and telemedicine, usually the anchor of that grant is in an urban setting uh, because obviously the, the, um, the services are not necessarily readily available in that rural community. So uh, the anchor is normally in an urban setting where they can reach out into the rural communities. And I mean, we've seen some really life-changing, life-saving uh, things that have happened across the country using this distance learning and telemedicine grant. Uh, and that you know that's an opportunity that's uh, that's only open for a particular period in the year, but we do have other programs that are open um, all the time, such as that community facilities program that I talked about um, earlier that could help address some of those opportunities as well. That likewise could be used with an urban setting as an anchor. Uh, so uh, again, uh, you know, while I don't know that there's any one solution, there are multiple examples across the country where there have been successes, and we're hoping to have some of those uh, opportunities here in Louisiana to address it as well. See, and so I also might mention our USDA OPR website has a list of best practices. Um, if you scroll down towards the bottom, um, there's a number of different opportunities for you to view and see what other states are doing. Mobile clinics is one of them that I think is just absolutely phenomenal. You talk about access, transportation needs. Uh, there are things that we can do to be able to help provide those services as well. So, so go on there. The other thing is, is that webinar. So I'm, I'm on the USDA Opioid Task Force, and we're about identifying what these options are and being able to communicate that to everybody. Because what might work in North Carolina might also work in Louisiana. What might not work in Nebraska might not work here in Louisiana. So we're about identifying what the options are, making sure that we're addressing some of the cultural issues that we have that are unique to Louisiana. But go on that website, and what I would hope that we would do is, is if anybody knows of any potential opportunities or any ideas that we need to look at and explore, let us know. We'll go ahead and take that all the way to Congress, to D.C., whoever needs to know. And Terry, what we're looking at is we're, I think we're going to try to get away from not wholly sort of distributed network that we're talking about that you all funded, but we're looking more at these things, yeah. right, and specifically for, for what you all are talking about for the, the particular – counseling that is, that is the ongoing counseling that's required. So I sure hope that our hackers that are working 24 hours are going to be coming up with solutions for these types of devices. Uh, you know, it's interesting that USGS has an app, especially after earthquakes, and it asks you a question. Right. How did it feel? So in other words, how did you feel? What, did, what happened? And I'm thinking, why can't we use that for help? Where you can have almost instantaneous data for those that need to provide information to those who can use it. We talked about data. How do you feel? How do you feel today? How did you feel yesterday? How do you feel this afternoon? How do you feel after this event? So there's, there's really unlimited possibilities. We just, not, we just need to put our thinking caps on and make sure that we have the right people in the room. To your point about making sure that we have the recovery community involved, that's the first time that I've heard that. It's not going to be the last time that we hear it either. So thank oh, you. For I that. wanted to say that there's a yeah, sort of just what she said. There's a there's a huge untapped resource in the rural communities, which is the recovery community, um, and there is a program that is um, somewhat funded uh, called peer support specialists. And these are paid positions. They're not paid well. They should be paid a lot more. But it's people who are in recovery. Um, who help assist other people in recovery, both getting into treatment um, and, that, and that process of, of leaving treatment and re-entering the community that is really hard, um, so underused, so inexpensive. Um, there is a, there's a great story that I think can apply to recovery, which is if you look at a sick tree, you ever seen a sick tree, a sick and dying tree? and it's in sick and dying soil. And someone takes that tree and they, and they dig it up and they bring it into the sunshine and this beautiful soil and the tree gets beautiful and healthy. And then what we do when we, when we say, okay, it's time to go, is we take that tree and we throw it back into that old soil and we wonder why the tree gets sick again. So the peer support specialists can be that, 
that segue back into the recovery community where people can get well and stay well with the sustained um, treatment um, that they need. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, we're gonna, we almost complete with the program, but Secretary Gee is, is still here, and I'd like her just to address you before she heads off to Baton Rouge. And oh, I'm so sorry. So from your vantage point as a practitioner, you, you pretty much take it to where it needs to be and where is the responsibility on the, on the patient side? Sure. Yes. And, and um, let's keep in mind again that we're talking about someone with the disease and someone who's in active addiction, that's not really a choice, you know? So this person doesn't get it, their brain's not working. And we have to think about how do we get that person out of the active addiction to be well enough to listen to the important things that you're trying to tell them. Um, and in order to do that, we need to raise their dopamine level. And there's lots of things that do that. I think Dr. Gee grew up in a, um, in a community you know, and being in a community raises dopamine. Feeling connected to other people raises dopamine. Spirituality raises dopamine. So having someone like a peer support specialist who understands that, you know, who can be there when that person's about to leave treatment and have a five, 10 minute talk with them, you're gonna increase the odds that that person stays and listens to exactly what you as the professional is telling them that actually works and helps. And so sometimes we get to the point where the people are having severe consequences uh, for the actions and unfortunately it's because of a disease in many cases. And so I hear what you're saying because I have these juveniles in my drug court and it takes um, a while before they're ready to participate and be active in their recovery, if at all. What I do see is exactly what Jennifer's saying. Their recovery is based on the support that they have. And oftentimes, we don't even start out talking about um, the disease or the drug that they're taking. We start talking about what's underlying, what, whatever started this. And you know, it, if you start off with, well, I had a back surgery and I got prescriptions, that's a whole different kind of treatment than it is, well, when I was a child or when I was younger, I was abused and I have you know, PTSD from uh, what's going on. So you first have to find out where um, does the substance use disorder originate? Does it originate through, um, from the actual taking of the drug because of some um, medical situation, or does it start from, um, and I'll just say self-medicating, because of some pain you feel within, and then you have to, the support is key, support, whether you're the, the medical support, whether you, and I think that's where education on the ACEs come in. If any of you have heard of ACEs, has anybody heard of ACEs? The Adverse Childhood Experiences, which is one of the number one public health concerns in the nation, which goes to all of this, and also to being trauma-informed, 
that's where you can be of great support as a medical professional um, is to be informed about that also um, with how you begin the treatment. Okay, great. Well, our time is up, and I wanted to thank the panelists and thank our prior speakers. Dr. Gershanik's data was fantastic. It was wonderful to, to bring Bruce back home. Senator Cassidy had very insightful remarks. Uh, Jennifer, you moved me to tears but taught me some new lessons. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, it's wonderful to be in a state that has so much going on. We are, despite the fact that we have challenges, so coordinated, and all of us are activated, understanding this is a problem. And let's leave today with a commitment to do what we can to fix it, to help those in recovery, to reduce stigma, and to do all we can uh, to make sure no one dies. Remember, uh, naloxone is available at any pharmacy in the state. And if you know someone who may be at risk, keep it stocked, educate, and make sure as we fight this problem, let's make sure that people don't die while they're um, getting on the path to recovery. So this has been a phenomenal day. I really thank UL and Ramesh and Henry and all of the folks here, our wonderful young people who are going to fix this problem for the future and innovate. Um, thank you so much. And I will um, turn it over back over to Carrie just to say some closing remarks. Oh, and, and Senator Mills, who was a surprise but really happy um, <laughs> visit. Um, thank you so much for being here. So we're going to wrap up. I'm sure Ramesh has some, some uh, marching orders before we leave, but I, I do want to recognize President Sabwa, who's in the room and who's partnered with us. Uh, I got to say, Being alumni never felt so good. So thanks again. It's been a great opportunity here. Great to come back. Great to come back home. And so proud of the panelists and really proud of the state. we got a lot of great work to do. And the only way, again, that we can do this is with partnerships, with innovation, and with doing the things that we do best and, and really helping each other. So thanks again. Ramesh. Good job, Carrie. And thank you, everyone, for your commitment to the cause and for uh, staying engaged throughout the day. I know that half of our crowd is across the road uh, uh, hacking and coding, and they'll be doing so for the next 24 hours. So if, you're, if, you, if you have another two hours to spare, tomorrow evening at 4 to 6 PM is the award ceremony, and Congressman Higgins will be here to hand out the awards uh, for the winningest ideas and the coolest technology innovations that we believe uh, those students and professional software developers are going to be working on uh, to produce as they see fit as innovations that can help move the dial. But today's conversation was extraordinary, informative. We have the right leadership in the state. Secretary Guy, uh, your leadership from the front, your commitment to the cause. Senator Bill, thank you for being here at such incredible short notice. And our partners at, uh, from USDA and HHS we are taking an all-hands-on-the-deck on the deck approach because that's what it will take. It will take coordination across all levels, across public and private sector partners, across university leaders and practitioners, all of us co committing to this cause and pulling in the same direction. And Jennifer, your conversation, your comments, your life story was so compelling uh, that we decided that we will not serve beer this evening at the crawfish boil. And I'll take the fall for that. <laughs> It was a tough call to make, but it was the right call to make based on your conversation. We have lots of students there. And so uh, I think there is, it takes all kinds of solutions. And perhaps limiting access is maybe one of those. I will not say this same, same statement tonight after the crawfish boil ends. Uh, but at least for the next hour and a half or so, we will not uh, have alcohol at the crawfish boil. And, uh, but these, these are perhaps the kinds of small steps that we need to take to, to uh, I, I'll put it all on you. Because even if I say that I came up with this idea, people, I don't have that kind of cred around here. So, <laughs> and you talked about ACE. And one of the uh, uh, phenomenal researchers on our campus is the author of and she does a lot of research in A, so maybe we can visit uh, afterwards. But thank you. And this is what a research university should be doing. We should be stimulating conversations. We should be hosting these kinds of discussions. And I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to do so and to have had, an, uh, had a role in pulling all of this great 
uh, minds together and uh, let's go commit to this and hopefully we'll be able to move the dial before too long. Thank you. Please note that the crawfish boil is across the road at 4 p.m. <laughs>